may be one of the biggest questions I could possibly ask. The question is, and this is the question that I guess people come to listen to this panel for. The main question is, what should we do to prevent cancer? Can it be prevented? What about if you already have early stage cancer? Can it be beaten with lifestyle and natural non-invasive methods? We understand that there are brilliant um, oncologists that we could go and they could tell us all about um, what to do if you have it. But can, what should we do to prevent cancer? Can it be prevented? And what if you already have an early stage cancer? Can it be beaten with lifestyle, diet, and natural non-invasive methods? Any of you can answer that. Well, I'd like to take a crack at this, making a comment here on this. One of the things that struck me first about this uh, question of diet and cancer uh, way many years ago now, gosh, in the, I guess early 60s, early 70s, uh, there were studies coming out at the time that showed, and these were correlation studies, and we know the difficulty of understanding correlation studies, but nonetheless, when uh, uh, countries were compared around the world with halfway decent data, uh, the, the linear regression between cancer and, let's say, saturated fat, which I would argue is may, may, mainly a surrogate for animal food consumption, the, the linear regression uh, actually was such that the line came right down through the XY origin. It was a straight line relationship almost. That then was repeated uh, three or four times after that by other researchers. And, and so there it is. It's, it's really stark, that relationship. Um, obviously, it doesn't say much about, uh, you know, what is the connection, if you will. Uh, but when it's exploring it from various society different perspectives, it was clear diet played a major role. And then ha as to how it worked, uh, that's where I spent a good part of my time and my career was trying to understand, you know, the mechanisms as to how diet might work. We got some ideas on that. So I would argue that the, the role of diet and let I me mean, call it nutrition, I probably prefer to call it that. The relationship of nutrition with uh, the prevention of cancer is pretty impressive. It really is. The problem comes up is to where, what do we do with, with cancer patients, of course. I'm not a clinician, so I don't have a chance to participate in that sort of thing. But uh, my youngest son, who co-authored the book with me, has just now got a, a really pretty exciting study on stage four breast cancer at the University of Rochester going right now. And so far seeing some pretty respectable results, it seems to me, but that's the, that's the link that's missing, Steve. Uh, you know, we, we see these uh, overarching data that tells us, hey, there's something here. It really is pretty impressive. And it's not due to one nutrient, I would argue. Um, and it's a constellation of effects of a particular kind of diet, you know, uh, rich in animal protein, lacking in the plant protein, if you those foods as far as causation is concerned. But uh, we got some work to do on the cancer thing. Uh, if we can just figure out a way to do these kind of intervention studies, clinical trials are hard to imagine to some extent, but to, to do the intervention studies that are going to be required to understand whether or not nutrition can play a role in people who've been diagnosed with cancer. We can't really answer that very well at the moment, hardly at all. That's one of my colleagues want to offer something, but uh, I think Bill had some comments. I'll go last. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to weigh in on this. Um, you know, building on what Dr. Campbell just um, described in the prevention setting. Um, uh, you know, I actually take care of cancer patients. And also um, really pri prize and prioritize the understanding of how to prevent uh, the disease itself. So we have so much emphasis on genetic diagnoses. You know, you go uh, to these different clinics to do cancer screening, and that's an important thing to do. Uh, we know that your genetic um, links to colon cancer and breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, ovarian cancer. There's genes like BRCA, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, and those are actually really important um, things to do. But in reality, only about five to 10, probably closer to 5% of cancers are genetically spawned. So that leaves 90 to 95% of cancers that are really more attributed to our lifestyle and our environment, not just in the last 
year or two, but really over the course of your lifetime. And that speaks to the importance of a lifetime of lifestyle uh, and that the changes uh, that can occur in the body um, happen over a, a long period of time. Um, one of the things that I actually study um, is an, an interesting involution of the question, why do we get cancer? We know smoking causes it. We know too much ultraviolet exposure causes it. We know that chemical exposures can actually cause cancer as well, as well as radiation. But actually, a more interesting question is why don't we get cancer more often? Why is it that you know we get cancer only when we're getting when we're older, um, when we tend to actually have these noxious exposures, when in fact we our entire bodies are insulted throughout the course of our lives? And so that's led sort of to a very interesting investigation on how the body actually resists cancer. So we know that cancer is dependent on a blood supply. We know that our body can actually prevent excess blood vessels from growing to feed a cancer. We know that cancers actually um, uh, establish and then renew themselves using stem cells. We also know that there are vulnerabilities to stem cells, some of which are actually um, uh, can be actually driven to extinguish a, a cancer stem cells that dietary in nature. We know that our microbiome actually also influences inflammation, uh, influences our immune system, and both of those actually are tied um, uh, uh, too much inflammation to cancer and poor immunity to the development of cancer. And all, of course, our DNA, which is subject to mutation. Um, most people don't know that, you know, we talk about tanning salons being bad for us, but even people that stay indoors have on average 10,000 genetic DNA mistakes that are made every single day. And fortunately, our body can repair those mistakes um, so that um, we don't actually have consequences that are at least noticeable. And then finally, our immune system. Uh, we do know for a fact that when our immunity is down, uh, we may, are more vulnerable to cancers. For example, HIV, uh, immunosuppression, uh, can actually lead to higher rates of cancer. But what's really interesting to me as somebody who's been involved with drug development for cancer drugs, is that we can use immunotherapies to tank up um, someone's uh, immune system during cancer, during, during the battle with cancer. And we can actually, in some cases, use our own immune system to wipe out cancer, even metastatic cancer. And that is also influenced by diet. So I think that, you know, w one question is really, you know, why don't we get cancer more often? Oh, because our body is actually well equipped to actually resist cancer on a daily basis but these insults that occur which may be dietary in nature uh over amount of saturated fats and salts and so on and so forth um can be a negative factor but then the flip side of it is the healthier diets which you know dr campbell wrote about long ago um, um actually may actually be able to tip the balance in the other direction to assist the body in resisting disease well, although I'm a cardiologist, we've been um, um, having to manage patients or provide nutritional support for many patients with cancer. Many of them have heart disease in addition to other chronic illnesses. And you know, I think the comments of um, both my colleagues, Dr. Lee and Campbell are on point in the sense that um, we clearly see that individuals on high animal protein diets who are, have high chemical exposure, and of course, both of these things lead to an abnormal microbiome. And in my discussion earlier today, I talked about uh, some of the underlying pillars of chronic illness, as well as acute illness, uh, of which uh, cancer can be, uh, is a part of rather, uh, is inflammation, uh, excess oxidative stress, and an abnormal microbiome. And uh, these things work in concert to sort of break down our body's architecture. And so, uh, you know, cancer builds uh, the, the, the underlying foundation for chronic illness in general, cancer in particular, builds up over time. Uh, our experience with cancer patients, most of the people that we see come in with uh, a, a myriad of diseases. Uh, they have heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, and oh, by the way, I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I don't want to undergo chemotherapy, et cetera. And so our approach is an aggressive nutritional regimen. We use a raw plant-based diet, a defined plant-based diet. Uh, we have a food classification system. So we're very precise in the foods that they consume and don't consume. Uh, it consists of you know, uh, high amounts of uh, leafy greens, 
superfoods such as algae, uh, powdered greens, organic substances, sea vegetables, and the like. Uh, so we try to shower the body with uh, heavy micronutrients uh, in our foodaceutical uh, nutrition center. So we start from that approach. Uh, the next approach will be to use uh, selected uh, nutraceuticals or uh, supplements on a targeted basis. We've used intravenous vitamin C at uh, modest to high doses, liposomal formulation. Uh, we give other antioxidants such as MSM, uh, different things that help decrease oxidative stress uh, as well as decrease inflammation. Uh, this is a very similar protocol that I use in my advanced heart failure patients uh, and so, as well as my patient with advanced inflammatory disease. Uh, and we've had good outcomes. Uh, many of our patients who undergo chemotherapy during this adjunctive uh, nutritional support regimen, one, they tolerate chemotherapy much better. Two, they go into remission much faster. Three, some of the other in organ damages uh, or, or abnormalities recover. One thing we, we're dealing with with cancer is that it overtakes the body. And you have excess inflammation, excess oxidative stress, and so you start to go into a multi-organ failure uh, phenomenon, similar to a patient with end-stage heart failure. Uh, so they start to get liver dysfunction. Why? Because they're having to take many different medications, chemotherapy uh, 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 being included, but they're having to take many medications due to the side effects of the chemotherapy, such as pain medication or the like. All of these things have an adverse impact on the liver, the kidney. So if you introduce an aggressive nutritional regimen, where you aggressively detox the patient, reduce oxidative stress, reduce inflammation, uh, and reduce this chemical toxic exposure, we're able to wean many of the other collateral medications, if you will. It allows organ recovery. You have to remember the body's ability, the number one uh, team, uh, uh, excuse me, the number one player on your team in fighting cancer is your body. It's a well intact human body, well functioning organs, well functioning kidneys, well functioning heart, well functioning lungs. So when you're fighting cancer, like any other extensive chronic illness, you're going to have to supply your number one ally with all the weapons that it needs. And it needs bombers, uh, uh, bombers and, and aircraft carriers and all these things to fight that enemy. So when you, opt, when you provide optimal nutrition for the body that's fighting cancer, it then turns around. It turns the tide. One, you're creating a milieu. Uh, that's difficult for the cancer cells to, to survive and to thrive in. And two, you're creating a defense against the cancer that will help destroy the cancer. We have patients with multiple myeloma, uh, colon cancer, GI cancer, liver diseases, uh, who do extremely well with optimal nutrition uh, and other agents. And we do other things such as get them outside. They take the shoes off, the grounding, fresh air, sunshine, vitamin D supplementation. All these things work in concert uh, in the patient who's acutely ill with cancer, and it helps turn them around. Uh, yeah, Dr. Montgomery, if I can ask a quick question. Sure. That really sounds exciting and, and, and kind of impressive. Are you documenting this at the moment in, in a way in which uh, you can accumulate the data, get it published and out there for people to hear? Uh, we're going to have to have a conversation, Dr. Campbell, but, but to answer your question directly, we're documenting more in our cardiovascular setting than we are in our cancer setting. Uh, right now, I'm working with uh, Georgia State University. We have an upcoming study looking at um, uh, the effects of our intervention in patients with known coronary disease. And we're looking at things like oxidative stress and cytokines. But what I will say is this, the information and science from that data, I think will help us in our cancer patients because what we'll be able to do, we'll be able to do some of these measurements in our cancer patients and look at similar things such as cytokines and, and uh, measure oxidative stress and, and things of the like and see how much an impact this is having. Um, the, the difficulty that we have is that we're, giving, we're getting so many different types of cancers and, and not being an oncologist, I just get them as they come. <laughs> Although my cardiovascular population is more organized and say, okay, I've got, I got triple vessel disease and I don't want to go through surgery. <laughs> Manage me. But but we, we're collecting data on more of our cardiology patients than our cancer patients. But, but um, I'd be interested to have a, a conversation with you because we are seeing many more cancer patients, you and Dr. Lee, uh, and uh, uh, share some uh, war stories and, and maybe take some notes from you guys because I'd be happy to collect data and, and maybe I can get some direction from uh, one or both of you. 
Well, I think this is uh, <clears throat> certainly fascinating to hear what you, you all have to say. And I think it's really bearing on this major problem. I've always thought that uh, there were two situations that developed cancer. Was one was initiation and the other is promotion. And I think initiation, I think uh, Bill Lee mentioned about the various factors uh, from radiation, UV light, chemicals, uh, uh, <clears throat> smoking. And uh, I'd like to just pull, uh, echo on what Baxter was saying, because when you think about it, <clears throat> every day in every one of us, there are billions and billions of cells that are being replaced, okay? And we don't want any one of those cells that are being replaced to lose their coherent signature. Because if they do, now, we, now, we, now we're in danger of having uh, a, a cancer. And it, it's interesting to me how slowly, but persistently, uh, I'm gonna to switch to cardiovascular for a minute, how consistently we've seen a plaque go away. I recently had a, a patient who <clears throat> started our program in 1917 when he was told he had to have bypass surgery and he refused and somehow found a copy of my book. And he got another angiogram a year later and instead of being 80% blocked, it was now 40% blocked. And then he had another angiogram, believe it or not, uh, same place a year and a half later and it was now Literally, you could not see the blockage at all. Now, something is really going on at a very basic level every time those cells in that plaque try to replicate. And they were turned down, and they couldn't, and it was uh, reversing. Well, look at, look at what Ornish taught us about early prostate cancer. When he, when he takes the serum, uh, uh, we put, you get uh, prostate cancer cells growing in a petri dish, and you pour serum on it from somebody who's an omnivore and 7% of those cells will regress. But now you switch and you pour serum on it from somebody who's totally plant-based and they regress by 70%. I mean, there are some really, very really exciting and profound things going on here, but I think what we've got to somehow eventually do, we have really got to get down at the absolute cellular level because once that, uh, that misprint, the loss of coherence occurs, then you know the stem, our stem cells are sort of going in the wrong direction. I think that's where the where the excitement in the future is going to be. Mm -hmm.